The man who took that small step and giant leap was Neil Armstrong. Mike Collins blasted off of the moon on 16 July 1969. The man who took that small step and giant leap was Neil Armstrong. He spoke those words on 20 July 1969 as he stepped onto the surface of the moon. He was the first human ever to set foot on a celestial body other than our home planet, Earth. Neil had been a naval aviator who'd seen combat action in Korea and a civilian test pilot in the X-15 before he joined NASA's astronaut program. As commander of Apollo 11, Neil, along with lunar lander pilot Buzz Aldrin and command module pilot Mike Collins, blasted off of the moon on 16 July 1969. Imagine a 35-story building being lifted straight off the deck by 160 million horsepower of rocket propulsion, and you'll have an idea of what that launch was like. Despite that, Neil's pulse never went above 109. The linked command, service, and lunar lander modules covered the 380,000 kilometers between Earth and the Moon in three days, three hours, 49 minutes. Average speed, 5,000 kilometers an hour. On 20 July, Neil and Buzz got into the lunar lander, undocked from the command module, leaving Collins to orbit the Moon, descended to the surface of the Moon. The autopilot slowed the craft with retro rockets, but when it looked like the lander was likely to overshoot its target and smash into a jagged crater, Neil took manual control, found a safe area, and brought the lander, named Eagle, to rest. He had less than one minute of fuel left in his fuel tanks. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Armstrong and Aldrin skipped a planned rest period, depressurized Eagle, opened the hatch, and Neil descended the ladder to make history. There are only five photographs partially showing Neil or his reflection on the surface of the moon. Uh, that's because he, not Buzz, carried the still camera. Neil's reflection in Buzz's visor is the best still photo of Neil on the moon. The crew spent 21 and a half hours on the moon, two and a half of those hours walking and working on the surface. Eagle blasted off from the moon at 17 hours 54 minutes on 21 July and docked with Columbia. They jettisoned the lander and flew back to Earth. The command capsule splashed down in the Pacific just before dawn on 24 July 1969. It's estimated that 450 million people around our globe heard Neil say one small step live on radio or television. At that time, that was well over 10% of the world's population. It's a rock composed of many fragments of many sizes and many shapes. When we return this rock or some of the others like it to Houston, we'd like to share a piece of this rock with so many of the countries throughout the world. We hope that this will be a symbol of what our feelings are, what the feelings of the Apollo program are, and the symbol of mankind that we can live in peace and harmony in the future. That symbolic rock, called the Goodwill Rock, is in the hand of Gene Cernan, commander of Apollo 17, the last man to leave his footprints on the moon. Today, pieces of that rock are in museums all over the world. Apollo 17 also has a long list of firsts and other superlatives. It was the first manned spacecraft launched at night, a spectacular sight. It was the longest manned lunar landing flight. Cernan and Jack Schmidt, the lunar lander pilot, spent the most time on the moon's surface and returned to Earth the largest sample of lunar rocks, dust, and soil. 
And 29,000 kilometers from home, the crew took this picture, the blue marble, the most famous photograph of Earth from space. Gene Cernan was a naval aviator when he was selected to join the astronaut program. He orbited the moon in Apollo 10 and landed on it as commander of Apollo 17. He was one of only three men to journey twice to the moon. Ron Evans stayed in lunar orbit in the command module. Down on the moon, Gene and Jack Schmidt spent 22 hours exploring the surface. Using a lunar rover, they covered 35 kilometers at a barren valley called Taurus Litro. Now, Jack, when we finish with station, hey, we will cover this whole valley from corner to corner. They even tried their hand at auto body work. They fixed the rover's broken fender with a lunar map, tape, and clamps to keep the wheel from spraying dust all over them. And in the moon's low gravity, they played soccer with a lunar boulder. Don't stub your toe. Gene got as close as a human ever will to traveling like a kangaroo. 99, proceeded, 3, 2, 1. And when it came time to leave the moon, a color video camera left behind transmitted these unforgettable images back to Earth. An onboard camera showed the lander's descent stage left behind on the moon. And cameras on the command module and lander recorded the docking approach above the moon. Good to have you all back up here. On 19 December 1972, 12 days after launch, Apollo 17 had a picture-perfect splashdown in the Pacific. Okay, here we have a problem here. This is Houston. Say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Those four words marked the beginning of a four-day nail-biting adventure that had the whole planet on edge. Through it all, no one seemed calmer and more collected than the crew of the badly damaged Apollo 13 spacecraft commanded by Jim Lovell. Ignition flight. Roger. Clock start, right? Roger. Let's just go. All in this. Roger. Okay, Fado has it. Look. Looks good here, flight. Good agreement. Okay, Bruce, how do you look? That's what he looks good, flight. Okay, Capcom, we go. Yeah. When Apollo 13 launched, the afternoon of 11 April 1970, Jim broke a record. He became the first American to fly in space four times, and he was on track to become the fifth man to actually walk on the moon. As Apollo 13 sped toward its rendezvous with the moon, an explosion rocked the spacecraft. Lovell, Jack Schweigert, the command module pilot, and Fred Hayes, the lunar module pilot, were in grave danger. The blast disabled the service module, and all of its oxygen supply quickly vented into space. Lovell, Hayes, and Schweigert took refuge in the lunar lander, which had its own independent life support system. But there was a problem. The lander's breathing system was designed to keep just two astronauts alive for just two days on the moon. Now it had to be stretched to keep three men alive for five days. Instead of being home base on the moon, the lander became an overcrowded and undersupplied lifeboat in space. Now, landing on the moon was impossible. The big question was whether Apollo 13 could get home to Earth. At 5,000 kilometers an hour, you can't just make a U-turn even in the void of space. Apollo 13 had to continue on to the moon and orbit it, in effect, using the moon's gravity like a slingshot to fling the spacecraft back toward Earth. Lovell and the crew used the lander's descent engine three times to position Apollo 13 for the trip home. Crews on the ground and Lovell's team on board the lander improvised and innovated as they went, making do with whatever worked. The whole world was watching this tense drama on television, but they weren't seeing Lovell and the crew. To conserve electrical power, no more live TV broadcasts came from Apollo 13. 
These images were filmed by the crew at the time, but were not transmitted back home. The low power levels even made voice communications difficult, and to save batteries, the lander was powered down to the lowest possible level. It got cold, but an even greater threat was the astronauts' own breath. They were exhaling more carbon dioxide than the lander's lithium hydroxide filters could handle. And the abundant supply of lithium hydroxide in the command module was stored in canisters that were incompatible with the landers. It was possible that the crew could be asphyxiated by their own breath. In a simulator on the ground, engineers came up with a jerry-rigged solution. Following ground crew instructions, Lovell and the others attached the command module's cube-shaped canisters to the lander's circular canister sockets using a hose from a spacesuit. They called this the mailbox. It was crude, but it saved their lives. Near Earth, the crew jettisoned the lander and service modules and took these pictures of the damage. The command module was aptly named Odyssey. When it splashed down in the Pacific on 17 April 1970, the world and the crew breathed a collective sigh of relief.